Hey everybody, it's Thomas and Brian and we're here for another live Q&A with all of our favorite followers and watchers and enjoyers of all things Aquarium Hilarities. That's you guys. Yes. You were confused. He's not There's nobody else in the room here with us. No. I, I don't usually do these opens. It's usually Brian. But you're, I, you're, you're doing very well. I'm, I'm trying. But we've got some fun stuff happening right now that we've been waiting for for a long time. Yeah, I, I, I hope that one of our subs, just in case, who's usually at these things, uh, he's been demanding something for like two months, three months? A I don't long, know, long time. Long time. Uh, so this one, uh, just in case, this one's for you. You ready Check to... Check it out! Look at this. Look at this. Tacos for Thomas. I don't see Justin Case even here in the chat, uh, which is upsetting. Um, well, hopefully he, he joins us shortly and he can see that you made good. And I mean, even if he doesn't, this will be on YouTube. He can just go find it later. Yeah, that's true. Well, we, we do have tacos for Thomas. So at some point you're gonna have to find time to be able to eat those in between all the questions. Uh, maybe you can start now while I give the, the usual yes. opening spiel. Okay. Ah. Uh, so hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, for any of you who are new here, uh, let me quickly tell you how we do this. We answer. All of your questions, well, as many as we can get to anyway in about an hour, uh, we answer them sequentially. So we're going to start at the very top of what YouTube shows me uh, in terms of the, the chat. And we're just going to go one by one by one. Uh, if you have a super important question that you definitely want to make sure it gets answered, uh, you're more than welcome to use the super chat function. We do really appreciate that uh, anytime you're able to do that and, and support us in that way. Uh, but we do otherwise answer them sequentially. Uh, with that said, uh, Thomas is going to do his best to answer every question uh, that you have. Uh, but if your question pertains to your specific pet and a very, very specific issue that they're having, uh, he may not be able to give you exact advice. That's something we're going to have to uh, we're going to have to actually send you over to our uh, bigger support team at uh, Big Al's head office. We have a ton of uh, experts there as well who can help you out. Uh, but he'll do his absolute best to help yeah. you and give you support here. It's, it's the hardest with fish illnesses. Yeah, because yeah. there's a lot of questions I have to ask in order to kind of drill down to exactly what it is. And also, that's not my field of expertise, but we do have an amazing uh, support staff that knows a heck of a lot about fish sickness. So we'll, we'll send you their way. Yeah, and the, the obviously when you ask the question, the, uh, the more context you can give us and the more details, the better. We'll help him uh, better answer your question. Uh, what else, what else? Uh, we had a new Mega Build episode uh, come out earlier in the week. Uh, so I hope, hopefully you guys are keeping up on that. It's a lot of fun. We decorated the, the tank. Well, you did. I did. And I just stood there and filmed the whole thing. But it looks pretty good. Um, I, I forgot you have a mouthful of food. And I'm like looking at you like you're going to answer. Um, yeah, so check that video out after this. Uh, we already have, hey, we have um, our main man, uh, Fat Rabbit. <laughs> Buon appetito. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for that. We, uh, we really appreciate that. So everyone, that's a super chat. Uh, Fat Rabbit, you are a superstar. We really, really uh, thank you love so you. Much. Oh, we got a, another one. Uh, designs by L. Thank you so much. Are you ready to get into the? the Let's questions? do it. Let's right, do enough it. Enough spiel. Let's get into <laughs> We're it. We're not allowed to talk anymore. These super chats are yeah, yeah. things fired up. You, you got one taco down. That's yes. pretty good so far. Uh, okay, so from designs by L. Uh, any tricks to telling the difference between platy and sailfin molly fry? I'm swimming in both. LOL. Oh. Um. Okay. So. If they're small enough that they don't really have any adult coloration at all yet, no pigments coming through, that would differentiate, say, if your platies are orange versus your mollies are black. If there is no pigmentation, I personally can't tell. So if they're too small, like they're actually just teeny little fry and they don't really have any color, I can't tell. I can only tell the difference between like a molly, platy, sore tail versus guppy fry because of the size. But then even comes a point like where you're just like, I don't know anymore. It could go either way. But uh, it's very difficult for me personally to tell the difference. Uh, I often just relied on the color of the uh, offspring once they started to get some coloration and then went from there. Cool. Uh, just a reminder, hit the like button. That would really help us out as well. Um, so our very first question in sequence that YouTube is showing me is a, uh, a good filter for a 45 gallon. Okay, so you technically could, 45 gallons is like right on that cost. Personally, I'll use canister filters on much smaller tanks, but you could uh, get away with like a decent hang on filter, like an AquaClear or um, one of the Seacom Tidal filters or something like that. 
Uh, but I would probably go for a small canister on a 45. It's just gonna make your life a lot easier and, and most people like to overstock their tanks and it gives you a lot uh, more volume in media than most other filters will. So I would say a canister, if you want me to get specific, I would probably put an Eheim 2213 or a 2215 classic series canister filter. Um, you could also easily put the uh, smaller of the Pro 4 series. And that would also be awesome. High doors canisters are also pretty good, but I'm an Eheim guy. I like Eheim a lot. I've got a lot of experience with them and they have never let me down. Yeah, Eheim's are jam, man. Yeah, man. Uh, and the same uh, <clears throat> the same sub here says, uh, it's my first time doing something so big uh, like this. Uh, and oh, also what's the best cheap all-in-one fertilizer for beginner plants like Ludwigia, Vals, and Wisteria and the best cheap budget light fixture? Okay, so what i would say right now um i like i don't like going necessarily cheap on additives because the cheaper they get it's either the more diluted they are or the uh components that they're using aren't necessarily pharmaceutical grade or whatever so i would say uh seachem flourish is a fantastic it's not overly expensive or anything but it's a fantastic general purpose fertilizer and i trust it a lot um as far as lighting goes the now i've only got a limited amount of experience with it because it's on the high-tech tank and that's technically doesn't have water in it but the baby tears are growing like crazy so um the the ista lights mm -hmm. uh there's the ista led light that i'm using which brian's gonna link to the video of the lighting i will link to the video and the actual product products that way you can uh, have a look for the price that light is bomb like it's doing a, a really great job at, in terms of um par output what what we measured in that tank with that fixture was excellent so i would say that is where i would go um if you're doing a low tech tank sometimes something with uh, a little bit more control might be easier but you could also just incorporate floating plants like frogbit or uh duckweed if you want to get duckweed um to cut down the light going to the bottom of the tank so you could put lower light plants down there and not worry about uh over lighting them and them getting covered in algae and stuff. But if you're, uh, yeah, if you're looking for a, a less expensive light with good power output and just looks great, that those ISTA fixtures are actually pretty phenomenal. All right, uh, next up, I'm gonna link all that stuff for you. I put the uh, the actual link to the um, to the light itself, and I'll link the uh, the, the high tech um, video for it as well. Uh, next up, I just got a 265 gallon. <gasps> Would, that sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah, I would like to put a clown trigger with a dragon moray. Is this tank big enough, and will these fish get along? Thanks, love the show. Thank I you. can't, I can't say if a, tra a clown trigger and a dragon moray will get along necessarily. Um, I've seen clown triggers in mixed reefs that were huge, um, and just mixed fish only tanks that are massive. Um, I. <laughs> I don't have any hands-on personal experience with clown triggers other than seeing them at the store and watching them destroy like everything you stick in a tank with them. They are vicious. Uh, Dragon Mori is probably gonna keep more or less to itself. Clown trigger is gonna be out and about more or less. They'd probably be okay, but I, mm. I'd caution you to uh, anytime you're mixing fish that are semi-aggressive or aggressive, especially in the saltwater world, to uh, talk to people with hands-on experience with those exact species so that you can get a really good feel for it. Because the last thing you wanna do is drop the kind of coin you're gonna drop on a moray, on a dragon moray and then a clown trigger and have any kind of problem whatsoever with them. So yeah, with caution, find somebody who's got both of them or has mixed them in the past or just general aggressive triggers with uh, dragon moray and see, see what they've got to say. Cause I don't wanna steer you wrong. Cool. It's a lot of money and yeah. beautiful fish to be putting at risk for me to just guess. <laughs> I, I did just link the high tech um, episode with the light and the light itself. So guys, have a look at that if you're interested in that. The uh, it's the full spectrum LED light that he was talking about. Um, what? Fa okay, now this this question again is one that we get a lot. Uh, someone asking just for general uh, a general question about what fish can go in a tank. You know, what would what do you think would be cool? Needless to say. That is a very subjective Super subjective. Question. So my, my, but, my but, throwaway answer to that. But let me just read the question. Oh, yeah, again. yeah, sure. Um, what fish would be cool to put with my guppies, tetras, platies, and danios in my 29-gallon community tank? Lots and lots and lots of stuff. Uh, I would even... Okay, I'll just give you one thing that I think is pretty cool. Or two. I'll give you two. Um, 
I really like uh, German blue uh, German blue Rams. They're really nice. Um, you could also, if it's a really heavily planted tank, do a Pistogrammas. Both good options. Pistos are probably a little bit more difficult than the, the Rams, but as long as you got lots of plants and everything's happy, it'll be gold. Uh, anybody who wants to know what fish they can stick with their fish or how they should stock their X number of gallons aquarium, go to your local fish shop, peruse your uh, local fish shops, um, you know, or fish section, and look at what inspires you. You know, just write down some names of the fish you see there that you think look really cool or very interesting to you, whether it's because they look pretty or they have interesting behaviors that you're witnessing while they're at the store, whatever it is. And then talk to one of the staff there uh, about those fish and find out if they're compatible or uh, what your minimum tank size for those fish are and so on and so forth. Like I remember one of the most fun things for me when I was in this hobby and I was starting out was walking through that fish room and just looking at the sheer crazy number of really cool fish and picking my favorites and figuring out what they needed and, and making it happen. So go get inspired. Don't just ask some schmo like me <laughs> what I think you should stick in the tank because that really doesn't matter. Uh, what matters is what you like. And I, I highly recommend you go for the gold. You know, go find out what you like. Good answer. Nice. Uh, next up, L. Kevin sent us a super chat. Thank you, L. Kevin. Thank you very much. Saying, uh, I have a 10 gallon and my water is still very cloudy. Two months after two months setup, I guess, is what he's saying. Um, okay, so a number of things could be happening, but it all depends on what color the cloudiness is. I've got a pretty good video that Brian's going to link on how I clear up just generally cloudy aquariums. Yep. That is more or less provided that it is not a bacterial bloom. If you are still having a bacterial bloom in your aquarium, something is amiss. So either you stock the tank too early and it never quite caught up. Um, testing is really gonna help you with that if you're registering any ammonia at all or any nitrite at all uh, with your standard test kits. Probably something is wrong and you're gonna need to uh, give the tank time to play catch up with that, use a bacterial additive, um, you know, hold off on doing water changes unless, uh, you know, your ammonia or nitrite are getting to unsafe levels. Ammonia is a tough one, but, um, it, ultimately that's, that's a patience game and just slowing down on feeding and allowing things to play catch up. Uh, if it's green, it's probably, um, green water, which is algae. If it is a yellowish color or a brownish color or a tea color, that is usually tannins from driftwood or your water source. It could be iron, for instance, my water, um, especially in the fall and spring when there's a lot of, uh, rain and stuff going on because I'm on a well, my water gets really kind of yellowy and stuff or orange. And that's cause I have a lot of iron in the water, but, uh, with those ailments, um, that link that Brian stuck in there to that video is mm -hmm. gonna help. Uh, obviously, if you have green water, a UV sterilizer can help, but blacking up the tank can help. There's other things you can do as well, so. But yeah, gotta know what color that cloudiness is and I can be a little bit more specific for you, so. Very good. Um, what type of starfish would be best for a small tank about 13 gallons salt water? Asterina starfish, and you can get them for free. I wouldn't put a, a starfish in a 13 gallon. They need, too much space like realistically i'm being honest yeah, yeah so serpent stars or uh, brittle starfish they often get very very large there are tiny 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 ones that will probably show up in your tank eventually that live in the the substrate that will usually come on live rock or one might be wrapped around a frag you purchase um they don't hurt anything they're a part of the cleanup crew you'll see them asterina starfish same thing although some people get weary uh, when they're in large numbers. They feel that they could probably injure coral. I've never seen an Asterina starfish attack a live healthy coral. That's just me. Um, people have seen Asterina starfish on healthy looking corals, um, which, you know, if you don't, <laughs> anything that could be irritating your coral is a bad thing. So we usually don't want those things in there. But uh, Fromia starfish, Linkia starfish, sand sifting starfish, uh, chocolate chip starfish, crimson starfish, pillow starfish. I could go on and on and on. None of those are really appropriate for a tank that small, unfortunately. So I would just avoid them. Or get a bigger tank if you are really dead set on it. Yeah, if you if <clears throat> starfish is something you really, really want to get into, I honestly wouldn't go less than 90 gallons and have a decent amount of rock work. And if you're going for a sand sifter, a decent amount of sand. Just because, like I said, some of these species are going to get very, very large and other ones have pretty specialized diets and keeping them well fed without a lot of rock work can be difficult. So just giving yourself the 
kind of uh, best case scenario uh, and best jumping off point, I guess, for keeping that species happy. Cool. Uh, Nolan says, setting up my first saltwater tank soon. Always done freshwater. That's going to be cool. Welcome to the dark side, Nolan, where it's very light because we have bright light fixtures. So it's not very dark. It's dark in on the wallet, I guess. <laughs> from I don't know. I, from what I've heard. Yeah, seriously. I have a goby and I haven't seen it in about two months. Is this normal? It can be. I had a, <laughs> I had a goby. Uh, it was a yellow, <clears throat> yellow watchman goby who literally disappeared for like two or three months at a time because... His cave was so deep in my rock work that I only saw him once in a blue moon. Just the way the power heads and stuff were set up, anytime I fed the tank, it would blow the food all around and directly past his little cave. I found it eventually. <laughs> but you gotta be at like an extreme angle with a flashlight to find him. <laughs> but it would blow it right past the front of his den and he would just eat from there. So I almost never saw that fish. I assumed he was dead so many times and it would be the day I was finally like, I gotta get a new goby. This goby's done. I was gonna say like, is there like a time where you just like pronounce him dead like no there's no way he's still in is there like a time and that would be the day he'd show up yeah that's, that's fair, the yeah. exact day he's like no i'm still here yeah don't even worry about it but yeah so it can happen i don't know if that's the case sometimes you just got to look real hard see if you can find it but uh i hope it's still alive they're pretty good at hiding patience yeah uh hey thomas howdy can't wait for the next mega build episode. Just a quick question. Sure. I have the 72 bow front tank uh, with a broken frame. Yikes. And I can't seem to find a replacement. Do you have any ideas? Bah. Uh, you could Euro brace it with glass. The The hard part is you need to take, <laughs> you need to, man, this sucks. You need to take the radius of your front <clears throat> or the curve of the front panel of glass and cut a piece of glass the exact same curve, but it can be straight on the inside so that it matches perfectly and you can silicone it in place to then silicone your cross brace on top of it, if that makes sense. So you're basically siliconing a small like rectangle of glass, like maybe yay big, to the back, and it sticks out like a little shelf. Then you do the exact same thing to the front, and then you lay a nice uh, thick piece of glass across the top and silicone it that way as well. So you're creating a uh, glass brace with silicone to prevent any unwanted bowing uh, for your tank. But the tough part is that front pane of glass because the glass has to fit very uh, nicely to get a proper bond with the silicone. You obviously can't just have like a huge gap. Bow fronts, trials and tribulations. <laughs> I see our, our man, uh, Justin Case is here asking about, he's wondering, tacos for Thomas? Well, just in case, uh, have a look at this. He's already eaten one. I already ate one. Carne asada for my main man Thomas here with some Coke on ice, just because you gotta have you gotta have Coke with, with tacos. Yeah. Or beer, but you know, Coke for now. Yeah. Beer. Fam We're trying to be family friendly. Be beer later. Yeah. Uh, so yes, don't worry, uh, just in case we did it. It's Thank done. you, my man. It's Brian done. came through. I did. Uh, okay, uh, next up, uh, <laughs> Thomas Bryan, I love you guys. We love you too. Yay! When are you bringing that big, beautiful fish store to Georgia? Um, you know what? Here's, I have an idea. Okay. Uh, round up all your friends in Georgia, all your fish keeping friends. Round them all up, and you have two options. Sign a petition. Yep. Thousands of names on this petition and send it to, to Big Al's, and maybe, I mean, I'm not, no promises. <laughs> maybe, just send it, and maybe if they see there's enough people, there, they might open one. Who knows? Perhaps. Or all those, all those fish keeping friends of yours in Georgia come together, get your own Big Al's franchise, open that, or become part of the Big Al's family, and we come down and film in your aquarium in your aquarium shop. This is an else. option. That's an option. So those are our two options uh, right now. Uh, apart from that, I don't know if there's any real plans to open one in, in Georgia otherwise. Yeah. But, the but, states are, are tougher. Yeah. Yeah. But hey. Uh, the maybe, logistics, because we're a Canadian company, so it, it's more effort, I guess, to open a store in the states than it is to just open another one here. Yeah, but listen. Like I said, you, you never know. Open, if you guys group together, open a franchise, and we'll be down there for the grand You don't like your fish stores in Georgia? Are there not enough? Do we, do we have a gap we need to fill? Is there an opening? Should we be going to the uppers with this? Should we be telling them, like, let's do Georgia? You know what? Yeah, maybe. It's, it's worth asking, I guess. Um, Andrew says, we will be nice to have one in Kelowna, BC. Oh! Well, you know what? You, you never really know. Um, back to the to the uh, 
actual questions here. Uh, okay. I've been recently thinking about getting a, an, is that an I-shaped aquarium? L-shaped aquarium? I don't That's know. probably an L. Lowercase yeah. L, which is uh, confusing. Getting an L-shaped aquarium. Is there anything that I should know that's different? Thanks. Are L-shaped aquariums a, like a thing? Uh, they are a thing. Actually, we people there are people do like them. Okay. But if you think about it this way, like if you picture like you've got a corner, corner in your room. house, yeah. So gotcha. or it could start in like the wall and then come out to be a room divider kind of thing. Uh, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, cool. there's, there's a few different ways to do it. Um, I am not a huge proponent of L-shaped tanks for no reason other than I've got my own ideas of what I think looks great. But um, if you have a good spot in your house for it and it's gonna make sense, the only thing I'm gonna tell you is that it is super important that you get it built by a company with a really good reputation for building weird styles of aquariums, especially L-shaped tanks or other um, odd shapes and supporting them properly. Because the last thing you want to do is spend thousands of dollars on a tank and have it explode. And I have seen them leak. I've seen panels break. Anytime we're changing the shape from the rectile, uh, rectangle box to something else, we're just adding complexity. And it's important that it is properly done and properly supported. I probably also recommend going acrylic. Uh, why acrylic? Because acrylic, when you uh, properly seal it, is basically a giant single piece of plastic because you are welding the plastic together. That acrylic plastic gets welded. It's not held together with silicone. It's not a glue. It is becomes one and the same. So um, less likely to have any issues. You got to baby it a bit more because obviously you don't want to scratch your acrylic tank, but strength, strength and light. So two important things for me. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Um, <laughs> Fat Rabbit, I think about the tacos thing, says, I didn't know we could make you guys do stuff. This opens a huge can of worms. I was literally just telling Brian about that. I was like, what are they going to come up with next? And I was going to stick with the alliteration, tacos for Thomas. I was like, bruises for Brian. No, I, I ruled that out yeah. pretty quickly. It can't be anything. <laughs> it just worked. It can't be anything <laughs> painful or harmful. Yeah. We, we will only do friendly things. We'll think of something. Well, you guys think of yeah, something. Yeah, no, no. We're not thinking of anything. That's right. It's a, it's up to you guys. My turn now to, to, to yes. Something. Next Not thing is bruises. For, yeah, bruises row. Uh, hey Thomas. Howdy. Yesterday I found a shark in the river near my house. Note it wasn't a bull shark. What kind of shark? What do you mean? I would love to. See it. Did you take a photo no, or a video? Is your river brackish? Does your river gum come from the ocean? Send a video. Send. Did you did you get? I hope you got a video. Or was photo it a freshwater it. shark? Was it was it like just called a shark but not actually a shark? Was it a Colombian shark? What kind of shark? You got to give me more than that. What is this? Yeah, yeah. Like, Tasing me. I'm hoping if, if you see a shark in a river, I mean, your first instinct, I hope, would be to take a video of it or something because yeah. that's what most people do. If you did, send it to us. We'd love to see it. Brian... It, was a, it was a kid with a fin on. Oh, my God. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Brian at Big Al's, and let's, I want to see if this is a kid with a fin duct taped onto him. <laughs> uh, okay, now let's see. Next up, do, do, can I take a 10-gallon tank I have and put it in a 30 gallon tank what can i take a 10 gallon tank i have put it in a 30 gallon tank without cycling can i just add 20 more gallons of salt water oh, okay i see mm -hmm. okay so here here is my answer to that technically yes however if you're gonna add any more rock structure live rock anything like that even if it's base rock it needs to be cycled first you don't want to be taking your completely cycled system, moving it into a larger glass box and then adding more components, whether it's sand or uh, rock or anything else that still has to then cycle too because it's going to cause mayhem for everything else. So I don't know if, you, if, uh, if you've ever done this kind of stuff before, but anytime you change anything on your saltwater tank, whether it's uh, replacing like um, your refugium with something else, like if you have like rock and stuff in your sump and you take all of that out, that can affect the aquarium negatively and it'll take time for the aquarium to catch up and kind of uh, find a new balance with that. If you have substrate in the tank and you decide you want to go bare bottom and you take all of that out, that causes a bunch of mayhem. And uh, you know, your inhabitants will show you they're not going to be happy for a while. It can take months. And again, you got to wait for it to kind of catch up and, and uh, find that sweet spot again. So although you can insta cycle a tank just by upgrading your 10 gallon into a 30 gallon if you're adding more live rock and stuff it's better off that you set the 30 gallon up 
with all of that live rock and whatever else is going on there, if you don't want to put your skimmer on it because you're reusing some components, that's okay. You're just trying to cycle the rock in the sand or whatever else. You don't really need to worry about having proper circulation and proper this and proper that. As long as uh, you've got a little bit of circulation, whether it's from the filter because you're running a sump or you put a power head in there, whatever, just so the rock and sand can cycle, uh, give it a chance to do that, whether it's a month or two months, and then move everything over and you should be gold. Again, you're still gonna run into problems. Things don't like getting moved. They really, really don't. But it's a it's a lot safer to do it that way than it is to just like throw it all in with some new rock and then fill it up and be like, hey, I've done it. It's just really, it's it's tough. And you risk losing pieces. And it sucks when you're trying not to lose coral. Uh, Yao girl. What? <laughs> Yeah, this just came in. What is going on? Yeah, Yao Girl uh, sent us a super chat for 20 bucks. Thank you so much, Yao Thank Girl. Thank you that so much. Really, it does mean a lot to us. Tim Bennett, keep up the great work, he says. Uh, another super chat. And Thank Tim, you so Tim, much. Tim, Tim, Fat Rabbit, Yao Girl, they're coming through for us oh. all the time. Thank you guys, really. You that, guys are awesome. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Thank you guys so much. We really do appreciate that. Blow my mind. Yeah, every week. It's just, uh, just fills us with... Um, the, the warm and fuzzies. Yeah. Uh, someone said, uh, <laughs> I love this. Someone said, Duran Duran called. They want their blazer back. <laughs> oh, thank you. I love it. That was a good one. You win some, you lose some. <laughs> we can't all have immaculate taste. Oh, it was funny. I like it though. You do, you, you do look like a, a bit of a, a aquarium rock star. I'll take it. <clears throat> okay, let's Hell, see. I'd, I'd be a part of Duran Duran. Oh, yeah. Let's uh, do it. <laughs> Oh man! Uh, thank you guys so much. Really, those those super chats are just every week. It's They're, so nice. Yeah, it's nuts. Yeah, Whew. you guys are crazy. <laughs> oh, what do you think is the best algae eater for planet tanks? Oh my fat rabbit! What is going <laughs> on? <laughs> thank you guys. Hey, hey! Do you want to see these guys just lose their crap? <laughs> Watch this. <laughs> Money fight! Oh, hashtag budget for Brian. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right. Uh, thank you, Fat. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, you guys are incredible. Oh, dear Lord. You guys are absolutely incredible. Thank you. What? What, what, what am I? What's the question? <laughs> what, do you, what do you think is the best algae eater for planet tanks? Oh, best algae eater for planet tanks. Huh. I've got, okay, I've got a few actual answers to this, I guess. If you're keeping, um, interested in keeping shrimp, and we're talking like uh, cherry shrimp and all those guys. Um, I'm trying to remember their Latin name, but I can't. That's Somebody always, will remember That's always it. the hardest one. Anyways, the cher cherry shrimp, um, crystal shrimp, all of those guys, uh, even a mono shrimp, they're fantastic algae eaters. They basically do it all day long. They don't really stop. And uh, they pose no real threat to the tank and they re reproduce on their own. With the exception of a mono shrimp, they're a little bit tougher, but the other ones without issue, you can get them to reproduce. They're fantastic. The only uh, caveat is if you have fish that will eat them, you're gonna have a hard time keeping them alive. Um, it's like little chocolate bars swimming in the tank for a lot of fish. You're like, hey guys, look at this. <laughs> Looks burgers. Um, so that part can be tough, but beyond that, uh, I, I always like using snails. Um, Nerite snails have always been good for me, although they will leave little calcium deposits everywhere, which can suck a bit. Um, I just got used to the look. I'm like, hey, there's white dots, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I also really like uh, using autosynchless catfish and uh, bristlenose plecos. The only thing I say is when you're using fish as algae uh, removal, <clears throat> you gotta consider the max size that fish is gonna get, what that fish's diet is beyond just algae. A lot of fish are not gonna survive on algae alone. You have to feed them something else too to complete their diet and round it out so that they thrive. You don't wanna just throw a fish in there uh, like, a, like a little Hoover vacuum and just you know be like, well, do what you do and then whatever. You got you got to consider that they are a part of the community at that point. So you're going to want to have to keep them long term, and they're more complicated than snails and stuff to keep happy. So that that is a consideration. I don't usually use Siamese or Chinese algae eaters, um, and a lot of other plecos are either going to get too big or don't even eat algae really. Uh, so yeah, that's my very short list. There are other fish and other uh, organisms that will eat algae, but those are my like go to usually if I'm working on algae. And that's fresh water. Salt water is a different ball game. So. Uh, that taco looks like it's getting cold. Do you want to eat that? 
Oh, I, I just don't want to stop talking to these lovely people. Well, you know, I'll, I'll take it for, for, okay, for a second. Okay, let's uh, for do this. Uh, second favorite segment. So you eat that and we'll, uh, we'll go into our favorite segment. Okay, so what did I learn this week? Now, I know you're eating. Uh, but I'm going to ask you a question anyway, and you can just answer with a mm-hmm or mm-mm or some other noise. Um, do you know how plants, where did plants on land, how did they come to be? Do you have any knowledge of this? <laughs> Very confusing. I have no idea what that means. I'll take that as a maybe. So what I learned is that a new study says that plants on land actually, potentially, come from algae. So they, they estimate that about 500 million years ago, so 500 million years ago, there was like microbes on land. That was it. No plants, no anything like that. But what, what they think is that uh, algae from the sea actually uh, worked with um, some kind of fungus, uh, left the sea. So the, the algae cell would crawl inside the fungus cell and the fungus cell could go on land. And it did. And they would work together. And eventually the algae would, uh, uh, these are the br very broad strokes, the algae would adapt to life on land and eventually it started growing into land-based plants that we have today that has thrived and, and enabled uh, larger amounts of life on Earth. So it all comes, these plants, from algae because of this uh, symbiotic relationship between algae and fungus. And it's really cool because what it said in there as well is that the algae inside the fungus they both do better together, so they thrive together uh, better than they would on their own because in times of, let's say, hardship when there's no food, they feed off each other in this, with, in this symbiotic yeah. relationship. Uh, so really they're able, incredible. They're able to survive longer. And, uh, and yeah, so essentially fungus brought algae onto land. Algae then adapted, grew into plants, and now we have rainforests and... It's actually like that, that theory isn't all that surprising because even now like fungus and and plants especially the root systems of plants have symbiotic re relationships as it is right yeah and they're still like really archaic forms of plants that people sometimes think are like lichen that's a pretty archaic form of plant that acts a little bit like a fungus and a, a little bit like a plant so yeah i mean that's incredible. Yeah, that's, that, that, that's, it's a super cool thing to think about. That that's you know it, it all came from the sea. We generally you know know that you know the good old right? soup known as ocean. Yeah, indeed. And so yeah, I thought that was kind of kind of a neat thing. I think it just got published a couple days ago. The, these this new theory on, on this algae and it's a lot of fun. It gives you a lot to think about, and it helps answer questions about why things are the way they are now. Yeah. Like for instance, the fact that fungus and plants can still and now work together. Yeah. Yeah, and plants are pretty. Where do you find this stuff? I, I just it pops up. Perusing, perusing. I'm, it, it, a lot of it just happens to come when I'm browsing, just anywhere on the internet, whether it's Reddit or whatever. I'll come across and go, "This is perfect," and I'm using it for the stream. So yeah, I, I happened to come across, and it was really, really interesting. And something, just quick little side note, plant related. Uh, they, I also read this thing that um, tree stumps. Uh, they found a lot of cases of tree stumps um, remaining alive, even though they should be just dead wood at that point because it's a stump and it's been killed, you know, cut down and killed or whatever. Tree stumps, in many cases, will actually still be alive because the surrounding trees support it through uh, their root system. They will essentially... And that explains why sometimes and... you'll see a stump with all these like branches starting to regrow out of it. Like, yeah. I don't know if this is kind of on the same topic anyways. Um, the emerald ash borer is destroying ash trees like right, crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a lot of cities and stuff just cut them down and remove them, but they don't always get rid of the stumps right away because it's a separate machine that does it. And uh, you leave it for a year or two, and then you've got what looks like a shrub, and it's just an ash tree that's trying desperately to regrow after yeah. having its whole self <laughs> chopped down. So that yeah. makes a lot of sense. On life support, and uh, it makes a, it makes a comeback. So anyway... Kind of, kind of cool stuff that awesome. was this week. So, uh, pretty neat. Uh, back to the questions, though. We have another super chat from Timothy R. Thank Timothy you so R, much, thank Timothy. you. We appreciate that. That's awesome. A lot of really nice Timothys. A lot of nice Tims here. Uh, hey, guys. Stepping into salt water after years in fresh, and I'm scared. I, ah. I have a 30 long and Aqua, Aqua Clear 110 to start. 36 inches wide, large enough for a pair of clowns? Yes. Anything else be anything else can be with them? Cheers. Yes. Um, 
don't be intimidated. A lot of the skills that you used uh, for fresh water translate I, like perfectly over to salt water. The only real difference between, especially if we're not talking corals and stuff, but the only real difference is you're adding salt to the water now. And topping up becomes more important because salt doesn't evaporate. So any evaporation changes your salinity. That's really it. You don't need to be intimidated. Um, as far as a pair of clowns go, yes, you can put a pair of clowns in a 30 gallon tank. Uh, you just wanna make sure you're not getting a species that is gonna get overly large. There are clownfish species that get much larger than others. If we're talking your average percula or uh, ocellaris clownfish, like Nemo, for instance, um, any variation of them, color pattern, doesn't matter. Uh, they are perfect. Like they're not going to get huge. Uh, I'd also say skunk clownfish are a really good option. Um, and what can you keep with them? You can definitely keep other fish with them. Uh, things like neon gobies, coral gobies, um, small blennies work uh, well with clowns. Um, a wrasse is meh on the on the, the the line there. I mean, you probably won't have an issue with like a six line wrasse or something, but make sure you got a tight lid because those those little guys are like little rockets and they can jump right out of the tank. But yeah, don't don't be scared. It's, it's a lot easier than you think. If you want to get into like small polyp stony corals like Acropora and stuff like that, it will be more intimidating, but only in the sense that there's a lot more to learn. But the only thing you're trying to do is create the right environment and then the corals and fish and invertebrates do everything else on their own. All you got to do is give them what they need and they will be happy. A lot of people act like corals and just are uh, and inverts and stuff are just trying to die at a like every second of their life they're like i'm gonna die today just because and then you as the aquarius are like no i will keep you alive it's not like that it's a lot more like just give them what they want and they they try desperately not to die every day provide the right conditions <laughs> yeah and then they just do their thing sweet complacency is what will will uh, get you with especially with saltwater tanks you can't get complacent you got to stay on top of it but that's it you got this Good luck. Keep us updated. I want to see that tank when it's all set up. Yeah. Um, can I put a betta with four goldfish in a 29 No. <laughs> Moving on. Okay. Next up. I would usually give a longer answer, but come on, people. A little bit of research will help you with that one. Just a little bit. Goldfish, beta, same tank. Probably not great. Thinking about starting a 125 goldfish tank. Okay. That's, that's good. I already have a comet and a telescope, each one year old, about five inches, nice. in a 55 gallon. Nice. What would you suggest for filtration and how many fancies could I add? Um, go crazy. Go crazy with a filter. Uh, whenever you're dealing with cichlids or goldfish or any fish that's gonna basically be high food intake, high bio load, high waste output, um, it's better to go bigger and uh, worry less. So I would say, Either the, ooh. I'm, I'm honestly gonna say you should go with like an FX4 from Fluval or an FX6. Uh, there's a lot of flow that comes with that filter as well. The label on the box is a lot higher than the practical flow rating that you're gonna get out of it though. So don't worry too much. And you can also dissipate flow in many ways so that the goldfish aren't uh, fighting flow in any way, shape or form. So um, I would say an FX6 would be grand but uh, an FX4 would also work pretty well. Other than that, I'd probably do a pair of Eheim um, canisters, maybe like uh, a pair of 600s Pro 4s, uh, or like a 20, 2080 would be massive on that tank. <laughs> It'd be huge. But yeah, that's I like to go overkill with these things because I know they're gonna be messy. I want the tank to be pristine and if the canister is too small, you're just gonna end up cleaning it out a lot more often. And you may find that the tank's just not gonna stay as nice for as long, long story short. But I'm glad to see that you've got goldfish in relatively uh, large aquariums. Yeah. Two goldfish, hey everybody, two goldfish in a 55. It's appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> How do I do a water change with a bucket and a hose? What? <laughs> Pretty basic, but maybe someone... Uh, uh, you start a siphon. Which isn't super fun. Well, it can be just fine. Depending on... We, we've we got an episode coming out real, real, real soon on maintenance mm -hmm. on the uh, low-tech aquarium, which, oh my, I did something special for you guys, and it killed me to do it. You'll understand when you see the episode. But um, I show you how to start a siphon really easily in that. I think we... Do we have a video on how to start siphons? 
Uh, you know, what? I think Josh one? had one where he used the uh, the Python the, the pump or whatever. The that's it. That's the only one. There's, no, there's, no, no. I'll have to look it up. The there's a few different ways to start a siphon, and all you got to do is start the siphon, drain water into the bucket, throw that water away, prepare new water. If it's tap water, add water conditioner, make sure it's the right temperature. And by right temperature, I mean the same temperature as the aquarium, and then slowly add it back to the tank. Slowly meaning don't just slosh it in, you know, pour it slowly or use a pump of an appropriate flow rating. And that's it. If you want to do a gravel cleaning as well, you'll probably want to get a gravel siphon, which is essentially a hose with a larger bell, usually a rigid tube on the end of it. Push that down on the gravel. It sucks up all the nasty that's uh, basically lodges itself in the gravel over time, pulls out all that mulm, and uh, keeps the tank cleaner, longer, and is better for the water chemistry because you have less organics that are in that aquarium breaking down slowly over time. Yes. I'm linking that video now. I found it. Josh, it's called How to Avoid a Wet Mess During a Water Change. Brilliant. Linking that awesome. now. And you can check that out. Um, he shows us some pretty good, good ways to do it. Uh, okay, next up, um, I want to change my sand substrate to a soiled substrate. Okay. How long should I leave my fish out of the tank after the change? Huh. Soil is such a pain to work with. I would almost recommend, okay, if it was me, I would be setting up a new tank. I know that's not practical for everybody, but hear me out. It is such a pain because that water, like uh, soil, when you put water on top of it, kicks up super easily until it's completely planted. So I'm gonna say that you're probably better off getting a tank that you can put your fish in for the time being with your like most of your equipment and stuff on just so you're switching them over and then replacing the substrate, waiting for everything to kind of uh, regain some sort of equilibrium. It could take about a week, might even take longer, but I think a, a week should do it. And then add the fish back once everything is kind of solid and in place. That way your fish aren't swimming through mud. That's how I would do it. I'm not saying that you can't do it a more expeditious way that doesn't involve another aquarium, but that's what makes me comfortable. Heed his warning. Um, hi guys. <laughs> uh, would meds cause pinkish water? My hospital tank turned pink treating for cotton fungus. Absolutely can. Oh, okay. Meds can change water any number of colors. Uh, blue is probably one of the most common ones because methyl and blue are greenish colored. Um, and it'll even tint the silicone. I don't know what med you used. Um, but yeah, medication can stain water. Uh, carbon will help pull that out, which you should be using after the medication or like you're done medicating. Um, and the medication cycle's over, you pull it out with carbon, make sure everybody's okay before they go back in the main tank if they're in quarantine. If not, you can just leave it until you see uh, more signs, hopefully you don't, of whatever ailment they've got, and then you can start a new cycle for treating once you've pulled everything out. Cool. Um, now we have a, the next question here. Uh, it's not very specific, so do okay. your best. I don't know what really you're gonna be able to say, but I, I have an Aquion 30 filter. Uh, it's new, but it's making sounds, and I'm afraid it might be broken. Is is noise normal? Noise to a degree is normal. Rattling or grinding sounds are not normal. Humming sounds, relatively normal. Even somewhat loud humming sounds. But I mean, if if you can hear it loudly, everybody's interpretation of loud is subjective. Well, maybe if it's like uh, distracting or if you... It should sound like a drone, like a a quiet hum. Like, like, if let's you're say, standing let's say you're, by the tank, let's you say your refrigerator. It. Sometimes it'll have a little it buzz. It should, should be less loud than your refrigerator when your refrigerator is making that sound. Yeah. Most okay. people's fridges go. Mm. Yeah, it should be quieter than that. But it, you should be able to hear it when you're standing by the tank. Not necessarily loudly, but you should hear it. Um, what I would do is pull the impeller out of the pump and make sure that there's nothing in the impeller well. The impeller is the part that actually moves in a circle with fan blades on it and spins to suck water and it creates the water movement. It sits inside of a motor housing, which is like a little well that it drops down into and there's a, um, sometimes a part of the, the housing itself, sometimes it's attached to the impeller, but there's a shaft that it sits on. So what you wanna do is pull that out, make sure there's no debris in form of sand or gravel or what have you inside of the impeller well. And you wanna make sure that there's no uh, hair or uh, anything else, fibers wrapped around the shaft, which can also happen and it'll seize the impeller. It can, can create noise, but more often, uh, what ends up happening is because it can't spin freely on the shaft, it's spinning the shaft with the impeller 
and then that can cause a jumping motion in the impeller because uh, you've got basically two points of rubber that are trying to hold the shaft right and it's like kind of torquing on that so long story short you just got to open it up and make sure everything looks good and then reassemble it and reprime it and try again and see if that fixes your problem Found if that. it doesn't you can you can have a look at uh replacing impellers or whatever if it's brand new then you can have a look at having it replaced um under warranty fat rabbit really liked your impression of the fridge by the way your little buzzing sound man it's, it's, yeah uh, I track. Yeah, he's been working on that for years. Uh, which is which is better, bare bottom aquarium or aquarium with substrate? Oh, subjective. Super subjective. Oh my god, subjective. Okay, but but in your opinion, okay, no, let's not even your opinion. Fresh water or salt water? Let, let's just say, let's just give a quick pros and cons of each. Okay, so um, they're almost the same for fresh and salt water. I think it's more important in salt water, uh, depending on the situation, but. With a bare bottom tank, all the waste is visible on the bottom of the tank. There's no substrate for the waste to get trapped in and or around. And uh, that means that it's more likely to end up heading towards your filter. You can also easily put a pump blowing on the bottom pane of glass to move anything that lands on the bottom pane towards a filter. So it can be a, uh, an easier way to keep the aquarium clean, right? Because even if you, you just have waste building up there, you're gonna see it a lot faster if it's not you know buried in the substrate. So you can just siphon it out a lot easier without accidentally sucking up sand or gravel, so on and so forth. Um, if you have species that cannot be on gravel because they inhale things and eat things like uh, axolotls, for instance, are notorious for accidentally ingesting substrate, even very large stones that you wouldn't think they'd fit in their mouth, um, which can be obviously detrimental to them. Your options are basically sand, things that they can pass through their system relatively easily without it hurting them, or having no substrate for them to choke on. So that's another benefit if it's a species specific situation. Having substrate often looks a heck of a lot better. You can't really do a planted tank well without substrate because the plants want to root in it. There are exceptions like anything that will uh, grow epiphytically or grow with a rhizome on roots or rocks uh, like driftwood or rock. Um, you know, you could have a bare bottom in that instance, but for if you're doing a Dutch style planted tank or you want to do baby deers, chances are you're going to need some substrate. So, um, you know, that's obviously a bare bottom's not optimal in that situation. For salt water, substrate traps a lot of uh, nutrient and uh, it can make it hard to stay on top of uh, levels in the tank, especially when we're talking about nitrates and phosphates and so on and so forth. So, it's a lot easier in some cases if you want a high end. Uh, you know, jam-packed SPS tank to go bare bottom because then you're not dealing with the trials and tribulations of having that substrate in there. If you have species that are going to pick up the substrate and spit it onto your corals, that's a problem. So, you know, having no substrate helps in that instance as well. If you, uh, again, SPS tank or any tank that requires high flow, if you have a lot of uh, water movement in that tank, chances are with all those uh, wave makers in there, you're going to start pushing that substrate around. You're going to create bare bottoms uh, or sections on the, the bottom of the tank where the substrate's moved out of the way because of the flow. And you don't wanna be pushing that all over the place. So it's a lot easier just to not have the substrate so you can have all that flow and not worry about it. Those are some of the reasons. So what do I like? Depends on what I'm doing. I need substrate for my planted tanks. I probably will use substrate in a future saltwater build. I've also uh, done saltwater builds that have no substrate. One specifically. Comprehensive answer. Yeah. Can I put a beta into my community tank? Sure. Depends. Um, you got to consider that your beta, long, long and short is yes, you can proceed with caution. Uh, as long as there's no other fish that your beta is going to misinterpret uh, for another beta or, you know, as long as that beta is not going to see, uh, it's probably easier with a female, but with a male, let's say, it's not going to see that other fish as potential competition. Um, and the tank is large enough that if it even does see a fish that thinks it is potential competition, that there's enough space that the beta can have its territory and the other fish can get away from it, um, then it's probably fine. But if you're talking a community tank of betas, it's a lot harder to do something like that or have like, you don't wanna have a 10 gallon tank with a beta and a gourami. You don't wanna have a 10 gallon tank with a, a beta and uh, what, what is it gonna just beat up for fun? Uh, German ram. There you go. Try not to mix fish that the beta is going to think is trying to show it up and make sure they have enough space to get away from each other. Make sure there are enough fish in the tank that if the beta does decide to try and single somebody out, there's a lot of other fish to get in the way. Cool. 
Um, we have people asking about the React series. Uh, someone asked, you know, when we're going to do more. We shot, we shot some. We have, yeah, we have more coming. Uh, they, they are coming. Uh, worry not. In the next, uh, if not this coming week, the week after, we have another episode coming yeah. out. Uh, yeah. This uh, gentleman here wants to know, when y'all doing the Thomas React series for an hour session on live? And I thought that was uh, an interesting idea. Why don't we do that? Maybe one week instead of doing a regular shoot or something. We'll do that yeah. and then the following week. So we'll go live and do like a, an hour long react series and then we'll go live the next. Yeah, I can get on board with that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just have to figure out the system there because uh, we have to find a way to get those tanks big enough to see and uh, we might be able to do it here. We'll figure it out. I'll, I'll figure out the logistics, but we'll do a, an hour an hour live. I like that idea. React. It's a good idea. Yeah, no, we can get through a ton of them, I think, because that's the problem is we have so many, and when we usually do them, we can get like yeah. maybe six, seven, eight of them in an hour. Hopefully, we can kind of rock it through get a bunch. Through a lot, and, for yeah, sure. I mean, we have like 900 to go, so I don't think we, we can do. get that far, but we'll do our best. So good you idea. You guys have sent so many tanks. Like, yes. I'm blown away, and I can't wait to look at them all. And they're all so cool in their own unique little way. Like, yeah. there's not one we've seen and just not been in some way been like, ah, oh, cool. Like, that's, that's neat. Good idea. Right? Everything. I find everything interesting. Yeah. Yeah. For a myriad of reasons. Yeah. So anyway, that's a good idea. We'll go live um, sometime next month. Uh, okay. So next up, uh, should I feed my Mbuna fry, North Finn fry starter food, or should I grind up some veggie formula? Should I feed my Mbuna fry, North Finn fry uh, starter, or grind up veggie formula? I don't off the top of my head know what's a North Finn fry starter, but long story short, if you've got fry, oh. It really depends. I don't, honestly, I've never bred Mabuna, so I don't want to steer you in the wrong direction. But long story short, whatever their natural diet is, you want to aim for that. So if you're giving animal protein, let's say, I don't know what's in that fry starter food, but if you're getting, giving animal protein to a fish fry that would not normally be eating any animal protein, but would be eating vegetable protein, it could be problematic. I'm not saying it will be, but it definitely could be because their digestive systems are obviously designed to deal with a specific type of food. So anytime you're giving them something that is outside of their regular diet, it could have negative effects. Um, so I always aim for whatever the natural diet is for that thing. Makes sense. I have a standard rectangular 30 gallon tank. Nice under gravel filter with Eheim 200, both exits connected to one tube for the riser. Nice. My question is, if I have an accumulation of rocks stacked and I don't, two-parter, siphon underneath it, uh, mm, that, that's it. I don't see any more here. Was there more to that question? Okay, so when you're running an under gravel system, even if you have, let's say, ornaments sitting on top of the substrate, and the nice thing about having that under gravel grate is that when you get your, your siphon and you push it down close to anything, let's say there's a castle in the tank and I'm going right beside it, because everything underneath is hollow essentially, as long as you're touching that under gravel grate, it's gonna pull from a radius. It's gonna pull uh, junk from around a larger area than just the bell of the gravel siphon because you've got a gap underneath with no substrate to get in the way. It's gonna flow a little bit more freely. So do you have to move that structure, which is I think what you're probably getting at? Maybe not. So long as you siphon around it very well and give it a chance to, you know, you'll see when you push your, your gravel tube down in there, junk's gonna be flying up. Eventually it'll go clear. If you move over a little bit, it's right around that structure and you see more stuff coming up, then obviously you wanna go all the way around. And if not, it's probably because you're, you're getting enough suction underneath it from it having that lift off the bottom of the tank, thanks to the under gravel grate, that you're gonna be just fine. Um, every once in a while though, you should always take as many structures out of the tank as possible, do a really, really good cleaning, put it all back. Once in a while, it doesn't have to be often. Just to make sure you're, you're getting a thorough job done. Tips for putting three male bettas in single community tank. Currently mine is 45 gallons, some plastics, four molly, 10 small guppies, and one male betta. No. Avoid it? Yes. Don't do it. Bad idea. Okay. How many platies can I have in a 36 gallon? 24. <laughs> Seems super arbitrary. Yeah. <laughs> you just pick that number out of thin air. Um, here's the thing. This is this is really weird. You could you could probably put thirty and be just fine. But here's the thing. 
They're not going to stay just whatever number I give you. Oh, uh, right. Yeah, yeah. They're live bearers. So they're going to breed. They're gonna so you got to get thing. ready for that. So what I would say is start with 6 to 12 and let the good times roll because <laughs> it's going to happen. <laughs> cool. All right. Uh, do you have any tips for keeping a spotted Congo puffer? No. All right. No. My, my only real tip for um, puffers are awesome. They're a lot of fun. My only real tip for keeping uh, any species like that is make sure they have the proper water parameters, right? So if you're dealing with a brackish species, I'm just covering like puffers, freshwater puffers in general. If it's truly a brackish species, you go brackish. You don't go uh, full fresh. And if it's truly full fresh, don't go brackish. You go full fresh. Um, if it comes from an area that has a lot of cover and leaf litter and tannins in the water and um, a lot of structure for it to hide in and around because it is not a puffer that's usually out in the open. It's hiding in sticks and stuff. Make sure you have those structures in the tank for it. Otherwise, you're not really going to get um, get that puffer to react the way you want it to. Not all puffers are like puppy dogs that are right in front of the tank. Not every puffer is like a, uh, a maboo puffer. They're just not. So, Or they're not like uh, spotted puffers, like um, green spotted puffers. Some of them like to, to be covered up almost all the time and are very shy. So just provide whatever that species actually requires. If you don't know, just do a ton of research before you get it. Research But have be, a lot of fun. Yeah, like always it's, such, it's such a, I can say that to everybody with every single question, but I really appreciate they're, they're asking these questions because yeah. this is them doing research, yeah. right? Unfortunately, I just don't have all the answers for every species because yeah. I'm not quite that much of an encyclopedia, but I try. Can, so yeah. Can you put tropical fish into an 800 gallon pond, nothing aggressive? As long as the pond is the right temperature. As long as it and meets clean. all the yeah, as survival long as, it, if, as long as it meets all the same criteria as the aquarium, the fact that it's a gigantic pool of water shouldn't make a difference. Keep in mind though, if it is outside, if you have any natural predators, whether it's birds or raccoons or fishers or otters or anything, you gotta make sure those fish stay safe. You got to give them cover in the form of plants or put a net over it or what have you because they will over time disappear or just breed forever. I just found a fish in my koi pond and it wasn't a koi. It looks like an electric catfish. Uh, if it is, how do I deal with it? I have no idea because I don't know what you're looking at. Uh, you didn't put it in? How, how did, did it, it get, get there? there? Yeah, that's a... Send us, send us a picture. Send us the full story. I yeah. want to know how, how that maybe we'll happened. Do a, maybe we'll do a feature on this. <laughs> um, I don't know what it is, but if it got there on its own, maybe it's a snakehead. I don't really know. Huh. If it got there by itself and you didn't put it in, either somebody put it in or it traversed. <laughs> Perplexing. Yeah. Did, did you have any floods recently? Could be any kind of catfish. Channel catfish, maybe. I don't know. It's hard to say, brown bullhead. I don't and, know where you are. And you think if you had a flood for a fish to be able to get in, some of the koi would have been able to get out too, right? It's such a weird problem it to is. have. How to deal with it. All right. I, yeah, I, I don't know because I don't know what it is. A fish net and you get it out of there. Yeah, yeah, that's basically, it's, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> have you decided which strain and which supplier of discus you're putting in your current big tank Have build? not decided, have no idea yet. I don't know. I, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure I just want to get wild type. Pretty sure. I know a lot of people are going to be like, there's so many nice discus morphs. I want to appreciate them for what they are naturally. And then maybe one day I'll move to like really fancy discus if I really enjoy them. But I love the natural form of fish more so than I do of uh, either hybrids or genetically uh, altered through line breeding or anything else. You're a purist, are you? I like to see them in their natural form, yeah. for, especially if I've never kept the species before. I always want to try to aim for the, just the most basic version of Start it first. Start from the bottom. And yeah. Then, yeah. And then if I if I really enjoy them, then I'll get into the crazy Can stuff. you mix the different types? Like, uh, can you mix yeah. the, like if, if you yeah, get yeah. born, a you lot want of them something are more. The, uh, most of them are the same species right. or I don't know if some of them are hybrids or not, but they're just different color morphs. So just like reptiles and anything else, like albinism happens in the wild, right? It's the same thing. It's like the albino gene just being right. uh, purposefully um, replicated. Oh, wait. So you'll, you'll, you'll start with the, the more natural type. And like you said, if you, if you want to add something later for funsies, then you can. Exactly. Easy peasy. Uh, all right, cool. Um, we are almost at the racetrack, but we have a few more. We'll, we'll, we'll keep going um, yeah. a little longer because you guys have been so, so generous yes, and, so, and so great showing up here uh, for us. So 
Um, uh, before we go on, I just want to uh, mention, uh, I, I guess Shark Week is coming up. Oh, Shark Week Shark is Week's coming a lot up. Of fun. And everyone loves Shark Week. Uh, and so um, uh, if you guys uh, did want to support us at BigHousePets.com, if that's something you wanted to do, they have a Shark Week sale going on for July 29th until August no, or something. Um, and I guess if, if you order like $50 worth of stuff, you get 10% off. If you order... Um, $100. If you order $100 worth of stuff, you get like 15%. And then if you order like $500 or, or more, you get 20% off your order for Shark Week. So Hey, uh, you also get a free Big Al's plush with every qualifying order. You get a big, a free Big Al's plushie. So that would be cool. If you, if you do uh, make an order uh, during Shark Week, you get that discount. Uh, plus, you get a free plushie. And we'd love to see uh, you taking that photos of that plushie. Yeah, next to your tank. Yeah, we'd love to see that. So you can send in photos of that. Uh, I just thought I'd let you guys Hashtag know that. Hashtag Little Al. <laughs> little Al, yeah, you could. Uh, yeah, so uh, feel free to take advantage of that. We just thought we'd let you know in case you uh, you wanted to check out Big L's Pets and support us there as well. Um, next up, hey Thomas, should I buy a canister or internal filter for my 10 gallon canister? Tank? Okay, yeah. I don't like internal filters. I'll tell you why. Because to, to, to do maintenance on them, you have to get your hands wet and go into the tank. You know what makes you not want to change your filter? Having to get it out of your tank. It's a lot easier to convince yourself if you're not feeling like it to go under and just grab your canister from under the tank and do maintenance than it is to get your hands wet and pull it out of the tank and disturb the fish and everything up. That's just me. Anyways. <laughs> uh, recommended size tank for the plushie. <laughs> what is the minimum size we need for oh, that plushie? I'm going to say I have one. They're about They're yay big. big yeah. I'm going to say since it's not alive, you could probably just stand a like five gallon up on its end and then just put it inside. <laughs> no water required. And we want to see it. Yeah. So send us that photo. Yeah. Thank you, Fat Rabbit, for, yeah. uh, for the super chat. You're, and you're the, awesome. Uh, amazing question. <laughs> you're ridiculous. I want to start seeing some of these plushies in, in empty tanks. Uh, okay. Uh, next up, what ratio is a good ratio for sump size to aquarium size? For example, how large should a sump be for as 100 gallons? As big as possible. If it were me, my sump would always be the same size as the tank. But is there like a rule of thumb? Uh, the rule of thumb is as big as possible. That's the rule of Believe thumb. Believe it or not. It should, like, I, uh, on minimum, I try to aim for one third of the, the volume of the display. But when, when we're dealing with a 10 gallon tank, you're not going to put a two gallon, you know, like, or two and a half gallon sump or a three gallon sump sounds, just like, it sounds adorable and useless <laughs> i know it is both it is both adorable and useless no you're gonna get a 10 gallon tank and use that as the sump right <laughs> so yeah like, the bigger the better i mean ultimately if i was designing like the last aquarium i was ever gonna have i'd probably do like a maybe 400 gallon reef you're probably like why wouldn't you go bigger because then i have to take care of it i don't want to <laughs> climb in the damn thing and do it I'm just thinking dimensionally 400 gallons, like relatively shallow. And anyways, I'd probably do that with like a, I don't know, 300, 400, 600, 800 gallon sump. The bigger that thing is, the less, less I have to do, <laughs> right? So anyways, but yeah, I would say one third on minimum. Half, half the tank volume is great. If you've got a hundred gallon tank and you've got a 50 gallon sump, that's pretty good. But if you can, Go as close to the tank size as you can. 100 gallon tank with a 90 gallon sump's awesome, with a 75 gallon sump's awesome. Yeah. The bigger, the better. Uh, hello, hello from Denmark. Hey! Hello. Uh, what is the best and most effective way to cool down a tank when there's a heat wave? Because right now we have 34.3 Celsius. It is hot there. I'm, I'm seeing photos of like from France right now, like candles in there, like melting over. Yeah. And just like drooping down so sad. How do you cool oh. it up? Now, th now, this is, I've heard of this one, and I'm not sure if it's a good idea or not, but I've, I've, I've heard of it before, is freezing water, water bottles water bottles, and putting them in the tank. Yeah, so that's one way to do it. But the best way to do it is just get an aquarium chiller of some kind. It sucks because they're, uh, they can be very expensive. Uh, it's like buying an air conditioner for your tank, and yeah. then you just run water through it, right? Yeah, because I imagine like the frozen water bottles, it's not very consistent, not it's very not reliable. It's not consistent. It's harder to keep track of. If You don't want to cool the tank too rapidly either, right? You want it to maintain temperature because you don't want to send your fish into shock. Um, but if your tank's getting too warm, putting a single bottle, like a single water bottle that's frozen into a 20 gallon tank will slowly bring the temperature down. It's not going to do it super, super fast, but you can't put that in a five gallon. Mm-hmm. 
You're going to chill the water too quickly. Be a tiny little water bottle. Yeah. It's the shot glass. Never mind then. I was like, I'm thinking to myself, where are you going to get this thing? Get like a little Kinder Surprise egg capsule and fill that with water and freeze it. Just the single ice cube, just drop it in. Um, there's also uh, another option is evaporative cooling. So what you can do is you can get an aquarium fan. Uh, there's a few different types on the market. I think we carry one um, by Zoomed. Uh, Aqua Breeze, something like that. I don't Check remember. Check it out. Anyways, but... Um, so the way evaporative cooling works is you're pushing air across the surface of the water, which forces evaporation and removes heat at the same time through through the uh, principles of evaporative cooling. So that's another way you can try to handle the heat. It, it only works to a certain extent though, and um, sometimes you gotta evaporate the tank pretty darn quick for it to work. The other option is uh, you could change the water a portion of the water for slightly cooler water to like just try to bring it down but that's relatively the same as just dropping a frozen water bottle in there you could do a diy if you can find yourself like a uh old bar fridge or something that somebody's selling for dirt cheap and then just run like 30 feet of an aquarium tubing through the side of it wrap <laughs> it in a circle and then back out and then pump the water through sure. it that's a chiller <laughs> but getting a proper chill is uh, a really good idea. I think we carry one called the CSXC1. That's a very good name. Hold on, let me see. CSXC1 by CSXC dash one dash one. Very very well named. I don't know if we still carry it. Mm, Maybe we don't. Just no type it, just type in chiller. Chiller, all right, bro. Eco Plus water chiller? No. So I guess we probably don't carry that one anymore, unfortunately. They it was are... a very small chiller for like small tanks, like 30 gallons and less. And it worked really well. And it's like a quarter, depending on the size of the chiller, like a quarter of the price of a regular chiller. Um, and it just worked using a Peltier device, basically. Great little unit. I have a couple of them. Cool. All right. Uh, next up, well, uh, good luck uh, with the heat wave, by the way. Yeah, hopefully, that sucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. hopefully that uh, subsides soon. That's that's nuts. It's Garbola. Yeah. Um, do you have any advice on drilling a 50-gallon acrylic tank? I want to add a sump to my tank. I've never drilled acrylic, so I can't tell you how to do it. I've only drilled glass. I would imagine acrylic's probably a little bit easier. Just make sure whatever bit you're using has been proven to drill through acrylic effectively. I would also highly recommend either using a guide, which you can buy, a portable drill press, which you can sometimes find where you just attach a regular drill to it, or an actual drill press so that you can get that hole to be perfectly straight and at a completely right angle to the aquarium surface. Because if it goes in on an angle, the bulkhead will not fit properly. And that's no bueno. It is definitely no bueno but yeah and slow and steady wins the race for most uh most things when you're drilling them just don't go crazy drilling through it super super hard also bracing the inside again i don't know if this is applicable to acrylic because i've never drilled acrylic but with glass tanks at least i'd always brace the inside with a piece of wood so i'd be drilling through the glass into wood and uh, that would stop a lot of the shell chipping so i don't mm. know if acrylic suffers the same um issue but it might you know, bracing hurt. it from both yeah. sides is always the best bet, right? It, that way it, you're not putting much pressure it on it. it. I imagine a piece of wood wouldn't be Yeah, great usually either. when you're drilling an acrylic tank, you, you leave, like you would do it while the acrylic protective uh, coating oh, is still on. Like hell. it's like a, almost like cardboard paper with saran wrap attached gotcha, to it. Okay. It peels off. It's a wax paper, basically. Kind of like that, yeah. Anyways, yeah, you'd usually drill it with that. And if you don't have that on there, then I don't know what you would use to protect the acrylic painter's tape perhaps good luck let us know yeah keep us posted Hope it goes super you, super well yeah, yeah, yeah. and i i'm excited to hear more about what you're putting in this drilled aquarium yeah uh could a fire eel go in a 200 gallon fancy goldfish tank 200 gallon 200 gals fancy goldfish fancy goldfish <sighs> probably yeah i wouldn't i probably wouldn't i I just don't like mixing goldfish with anything. <laughs> I like mixing goldfish with goldfish. Um, I wouldn't do it. I would put the fire eel with uh, 
other fish. I, I don't think the eel's going to cause problems necessarily with the goldfish or vice versa. Um, I'd be concerned. I don't. I also don't like keeping goldfish at uh, tropical temperatures. I like keeping them a little bit cooler, just like I keep white clouds a little bit cooler. Even though they can handle it, doesn't mean I, it's best to keep them at those temperatures. Um, yeah, I, I probably wouldn't. I'm sure somebody's done it. I'm sure. <laughs> For sure somebody's done it, but I wouldn't do it. Do you have time for a couple more? Yeah, let's do a couple more questions. All right, next up, uh, what's the minimum size tank for an alligator gar? You look like you're deflating. Oh, alligator gar. What is an alligator gar's max size? Four feet? Is it four feet? I just got to double check because... Oh. Yeah, you, you double check. I saw someone ask if my family and I enjoyed our vacation. Uh, my family's currently on vacation without me. Uh, they're enjoying it. Uh, I'm I'm at home working hard, so I'm not, uh, you know, I'm enjoying that to an extent. But actually, my vacation starts next week, uh, which is actually one thing we t we're, we're going to be mentioning is that uh, we're not going to be having a, a live stream. We're skipping the next one because I'm not here for it. Uh, and then uh, the other one's going to happen later in the month. So I will be enjoying my vacay as of late next week. And next. I will have to miss him the entire time. He will. He'll be sending me messages, you know, miss you. Brian. Uh, miss you, bro. LOL. Yeah. Remember when we tacoed? You up? Talk up for Thomas. Yeah. Um, okay, so I was wrong. They get six feet and like a hundred pounds. Or is it kilograms? Let's find out. No, a hundred pounds. So what's the minimum tank size? I don't know. Why don't you just fill up your swimming pool <laughs> with aquarium gravel and <laughs> stick it in there? Um, I'm going to say you're probably looking at a minimum of around 500 to 800 gallons per gar. For an adult gar. Like if you expect them to live its full life in your care and they live a long time, long time. Let's have fun. Uh, someone says about the fancy, fancy fish. Uh, my childish self thinks fancy. Do they have a top hat? <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Yes. Uh, and a cane and a mustache with curled ends <laughs> and a monocle. Uh, all right. Timothy R. Uh, oh, no. He, we answered his already. Stepping into salt water for the first yeah. time. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, Ooh, this is a tough one. I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll ask and see what you have to say. How to save a dying, gasping awesome. Why is it gasping? Okay, so one of the first things you should do whenever your fish is doing that is try to determine why that is happening. When fish are gasping or breathing very heavy, it's usually a very bad sign. So either there isn't enough oxygen in the water and they're working to bring in as much oxygen as possible, hence the gasping. So low oxygen in the water. Um, that can often be uh, in conjunction with very high temperatures of the water. So if the water temperature has gone up, your heater broke in the on position. Um, it could be uh, general discomfort because there's a lot of ammonia in the water or nitrite in the water or something like that. So long story short, uh, when this is happening, test your water and emergency water change. So you wanna double check your temperature, double check your ammonia, nitrate, nitrate, pH, everything. See if you can determine if anything is outside of the realm of normal for you. Uh, then you wanna also make sure that you're doing a water change with the water at the correct temperature. So you don't wanna send the fish into shock either. So you wouldn't wanna do like a 50% water change. And if the temperature is very high, do it like 10 degrees lower and try to cool the tank down that way that could be detrimental. You wanna bring it down slowly. So if the water was like at 85 degrees and you wanna get it down to 78, you don't wanna do that jump all at once. You would wanna to try to bring it down from 85 to maybe 80 in one shot. And that's still a very high jump, but the whole idea right now is we're trying to get oxygen back in the water and try to get your fish back into a position where it's going to uh, feel more comfortable. So you gotta determine what's happening and then why it's happening and then take action. And almost every time you're gonna end up doing water changes in scenarios like this. So you might as well get a water change ready while you're doing everything else. And then I hope everything goes okay. Fingers, Fingers crossed. crossed. Yeah. All right. We uh, can't end on that note. Give we're not gonna end on that. We have one more That's question sad. here. Uh, for fresh water, do you recommend running a UV sterilizer all the time or just when it's needed? Ah, uh -huh. I almost never use UV sterilizers, almost never. And I'll tell you why. Um, they're only truly effective uh, in most cases as sterilizers against algae. You need to get a ton of wattage 
in UV sterilizer to push enough flow through it for your average aquarium for it to actually have enough contact time to nullify things like parasites or uh, other microorganisms that are not plant-based. So um, you, if you're gonna run it as a sterilizer, you're getting a really big UV and you're pushing water through it fairly quick for it to be useful for the, the aquarium. And then you have to run it all the time. Otherwise you're really not doing yourself any favors. Um, otherwise just don't run one. Run one on a quarantine system, perhaps when you're quarantining new fish. But beyond that, don't really need to worry about it. The only time I really recommend it for people is if they're dealing with species that are very much prone to getting things like ick. And um, it's usually if their fish collection, you know, if they can justify, and it's sad that sometimes it comes down to this, but a true sterilizer is going to be very expensive by comparison to just a clarifier. And even clarifiers are relatively expensive when we're talking about filtering an aquarium. It's a component that's hundreds of dollars in most cases, plus you need to set it up so you have to add other components to make it work if it doesn't fit directly in line with your filter already. Um, and if, you know, your aquarium is a 20 gallon tank and you've spent 250 bucks on it, you're not spending $300 on a UV sterilizer. Most people are not gonna do that. So uh, if your fish collection is, uh, you know, very expensive and you've already spent a ton of money on the entire system, the insurance of having a sterilizer at that point might be worth it for you. If we're talking, you've got several thousands of dollars of fish in several thousands of dollars of aquarium and adding a $500 sterilizer to the mix is a drop in the bucket compared to what you stand to lose if something goes wrong, then that might be a worthwhile investment that you will never really know if it's paid off other than the fact that your fish will never get sick, potentially of the things that that sterilizer can kill. I'm not saying they can never get sick, period. Just from not from the things that that sterilizer is going to be effective at removing. Plus then there's the upkeep of the sterilizer. The bulbs don't last forever. You get maybe a year out of them before you should chuck them. Um, and some people would argue you should do it a little bit sooner because they lose effectiveness kind of in a gradient. It's not just gonna be a, it's great. <laughs> so yeah. Cost, uh, cost benefit analysis, and you kind of got to come to your own conclusion on that one. But I don't run them. <clears throat> Take it for what it's worth. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, we'll call it a day there. Um, uh, thank you, everybody. Like, just as always, our stream at the end of the streams, I just feel super warm and fuzzy and invigorated yeah. and uh, it's 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 weird it starts off super super hype and by the end i'm usually either way too hyped up <laughs> or i'm feeling pretty relaxed yeah like it's like hanging out with friends yeah so thank you guys so much for joining us we really do appreciate it all, yeah all, all you guys who show up uh you know week after week to to watch these with us and all you guys who might have been checking it out for the first time uh make sure you subscribe so you don't miss the next one we do these generally uh once every two weeks uh, every Saturday so uh, make sure you guys hit that subscribe button so you can uh, get notified hit the bell so you get notified when we go live you'll be like oh look they're live let's go ask a question uh, and then you also get all our other uh, content our mega builds our high tech low tech yeah. planet tanks everything uh, crazy we get up to another really really big build that is on the way um, <sighs> shortly that we're super excited about yes we get um, requests for it all the time and knowing that it's there and we haven't started it yet and people get little peaks of it like in yeah. a mega build they get a little peak and like what is oh, that is, is that a Blank, blank, blank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what? then... So, some, someone <laughs> went, did I miss something? Why is that other tank there? I'm like, well, you'll see. Yeah. So we have a lot of stuff. So make sure you subscribe if you haven't yet. Uh, once we get to 100,000, we're super close. Oh. We're, we're like we're like 6,000 away, more or less. Yeah. Uh, um, once we get to 100,000 subscribers, we are giving a ton of stuff away. Yeah. We have a gigantic thing planned. Uh, each, each subscriber is going to get like 30 some odd different ways to enter. So you're going to be, able, and then some of the ways you enter, you can get a, an extra entry every single day if you do certain things. So you can have a ton of entries into this contest. And we yeah. like, what are some of the things we're, we're giving away? Oh man. So uh, from ProClear Aquatics, my friends over at ProClear, they are giving us a, I think it's 53 gallon acrylic cylinder aquarium stand canopy and sub filtration. The works. Valued at like 2,300 bucks. Yeah. That's nuts. Akamai jumped on board. They're giving us um, uh, a light fixture, 
And these are all separate prizes. So light fixture uh, and their LRS, I think it is. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And yeah. um, an LR, or sorry, a KPS, the, uh, the Wavemaker Wave pump, pump. Which yeah. I love the. Just so you guys know, I love their products. They actually work incredibly well. Um, we've got Polyp Labs gave us a ton of stuff. Uh, RepCal pitched in. Aquatic Life pitched in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, just yeah. a ton of stuff. Yeah. And, and so I can't even remember everything because we were aiming for like. A hundred, a hundred prizes, and yeah, and then there's just t- tons of stuff. And then on top of that, like we're giving away a bunch of like Big Al's pets, like gift cards. Oh yeah, uh, gift to, cards. to use on our on our online store. Yeah. Uh, so, just there's so many ways you can win. Uh, it's all going to be drawn randomly, but uh, once we hit 100K, uh, we're going to be giving that stuff away. So keep your eyes peeled. We'll announce it. We'll have a video when that actually happens. But we're super excited for that. That's going to be a lot of fun. Stop. So again, if if you uh, if you haven't uh, been with us before, if you are new here, uh, if, if you're not subscribed, make sure you do it so you don't miss any of that. That's going to be great. Uh, we're very excited for that stuff. Uh, like I mentioned, I am going on summer vacation. Yes. I haven't been on a vacation in quite a while, so I'm actually going on summer vacation uh, next week, which means our next live stream is getting postponed. So we will go live again uh, for uh, our Q&A on August 24th. Uh, so it's a ways away, uh, so we'll miss you. Uh, but uh, so we look forward to it, so make sure you join us there. I'll just go fishing. Just go fishing, enjoy enjoy your time. And then when I come back, we, we talked about that maybe that first weekend I'm yes. back. It's not a Q&A day, but we could go live again and do a React, uh, an do hour the, React. Li- uh, yeah, uh, hour live React. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, make sure you guys sub so you don't miss that either. Uh, what else? What else? Uh, thank you to everyone for the super chats, by the oh way. Oh my God, yes. Yeah, every, every time we have a Q&A and you guys just, you flood us with this warmth, this support, these super Super chats and we just really like it any way you support us is super appreciated and that the like button even that means the world to yeah us too. yeah all you guys even just showing up and asking your questions guys we really do appreciate all of that um so with all that said uh oh you can also like i said uh support us on big pets.com starting uh on i think monday on the 29th we have our shark week sale so you can save you know d- depending on how much you spend you save percentages uh, and you get a free uh, big al plushie Yes. Uh, which has no... And I have one in the studio. Size. If yeah. you look at our videos where I'm standing in the studio, you'll probably see it. Yeah, you can have and you can have one too. Yeah. Beside you while you watch. Yeah. So feel free to support us there during Shark <laughs> Week or anytime. Uh, and uh, that's enough of my, my spiel. I guess all that said and done. Yeah. We just got to keep on tanking. I got nothing. I'm, I'm <laughs> like... Out. Yeah. I, I still haven't finished this, by the way. Do you mind uh, manning the taco cam? Uh, I'm gonna go finish my my last taco now. It's a little mm. cold, but that's all right. Even cold tacos are good tacos. Uh, so thank you guys. Uh, just in case, thank you so much for recommending. Oh, what a handsome man! Oh. <laughs> hey, it's me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys so much again, uh, and keep on taking, like you said. And we'll see you uh, August 24th for another live Q and A. Ridiculousness.